Good morning and uh, thank you very much to the organisers for organising and uh, altering this workshop to be uh, to accommodate the situation. So today I'm going to talk to you about some lessons that have become a lot more important as we try and build quantum computers with more qubits. So a lot of these lessons I think have been uh, known at various points in the community and then forgotten because they're not where the experimental focus has been. But now as we really want to try and invest multiple billions of dollars, multiple trillions of dollars into building quantum computers that are large scale and can solve interesting problems, we suddenly need to deal with all the problems of how do you address, how do you characterize quantum systems that where they're designed to encode to be more complicated than you can describe on a digital computer. So the, I'll start with a very brief overview, which I'm sure you've had a few times before, but just uh, to emphasize the points I'm going to be talking about more. So why quantum computing? Well, this goes back to the 1980s. Uh, the idea that if nature is quantum mechanical and you want to simulate it, then you'd better have a quantum computer. Um, and while the idea was known, it took a while for the algorithms to be formalized. So this started to happen in the the late 80s with Deutsch and then concrete algorithms for specific decision problems like factoring numbers with Shaw in 94, um, form, um, formally simulating quantum systems in 96, searching databases also 96, solving systems of linear equations and time dependent linear differential equations and machine learning. And we hope of course that there are a lot more algorithms but we're still waiting for the technology to be ready basically. So what is a quantum computer? The ideal computational model is fairly simple. It consists of three types of operations. We prepare n systems in initial states, we apply a sequence of gates, and we measure all systems independently. So you can talk about extra ingredients, but these, these ingredients will do to get a universal quantum computer if you can make them well enough. And this device, this computational model, produces samples from a distribution over two to the n outcomes. And like all computers, quantum computers uh, share the most common thing, they don't work properly um, all the time. And they're even worse than current computers because they're more complicated. So here's a picture of an ion trap quantum computer or a superconducting quantum computer. Um, and these really should be compared to, I'd say, the 1940s, 1950s era vacuum tube um, digital computers. So we've still got a way to go. So they don't work correctly. Now, on a digital computer, not working correctly means something like a blue screen of death or a hard crash. What does it mean from a quantum computer? Well, it can also mean a hard, a hard crash or a breach melting uh, going too hot. But um, when it's working, roughly within spec, it means that we've got a deviation from correctness where we have to always treat any kind of error in a probabilistic sense. So it's not just, did I get the right answer? Because I'm always sampling, I have to talk about the, the probability distributions and how close is the distribution I actually sample to the one that I want to sample from. And you can quantify errors in a variety of ways. There's uh, the nicest, the sort of most generic ways are to use generic distance measures on probability distributions. The application specific ones, which we would like if we were running applications, but we're not, would depend on the application specific topology. So the Shor's algorithm would be how close is the number that I get to a integer factor, um, integer multiple of a factor. <coughs> So we would like to talk about an error, and errors are stochastic processes, and we're talking about errors in a sampling process. So this is something where you can't, cannot ever really say one particular run of the computation had an error um, in that um, it's producing a sample from a distribution, and as long as that sample is not impossible, it's is consistent with the distribution. But you would like to be able to evaluate things on a, on a per run level, so the nicest way is to try and come up with a talk with a notion of an error that, that matches what you want. And one nice way to do that is to talk about a sort of hidden classical channel, kind of like a Maxwell-Demon 
type, where you can imagine that a noisy quantum computer is completely equivalent on a conceptual level, obviously not on a real level, um, to running a perfect quantum computer and then sending the output through a noisy classical channel that corrupts the data. And then the probability that of a data corruption is what is the total variation distance um, between the two distributions, where I just calculate the total variation distance by between two distributions by taking the difference, taking the absolute value, and summing over all outcomes. Okay, almost finished the preliminary stuff. Um, so implementing a quantum computer, you know, we have an abstract model. We want to talk about an implementation of the abstract model. And again, we're primarily concerned with errors in the implementation. We're not ready to run programs that are solving, you know, we're not really ready to, to try and tackle COVID-19 with quantum computers. And so we're not ready to run programs, let alone debug them. Um, so that means that we need to talk about the errors in each of the types of the instructions or the operations and how those, those errors will depend on how it's implemented. And luckily the implementation is fairly consistent across all major platforms. The abstract operation of preparing n qubits is universally cooling n systems to the ground state. And mathematically, if I go to a sufficiently large Hilbert space, I've just realized I was losing part of my side. Apologies for that. Um, in a larger Hilbert space, that's just preparing some unit vector. Applying a sequence of gates corresponds to applying a time dependent Hamiltonian. Those two are not in one to one correspondence. And the mathematical description means that I apply, uh, again, unitary evolution in a larger Hilbert space for continuous time. So it's a continuous time Schrodinger equation, time dependent Schrodinger equation. And independently measuring qubits is implemented by measuring the energy level of each system. And that corresponds to a projector valued measure in some large Hilbert space. Now the focus of this talk is going to be on applying a sequence of gates. And how do we characterize that neatly? And what are the issues that arise when we try and apply gates on multiple qubits? So to break that up, we have a time dependent Hamiltonian that's used to implement the gates. And it's made up from a system Hamiltonian H0, a set of control Hamiltonians, and a set of pulses. And if you want to know what, what's wrong, you look at the math, you take every term, you say that could be wrong. So that we have different names for the different ways things can go wrong. Um, rapid fluctuations in the Hamiltonians, either the system or the control, we would talk about as decoherence, which means that we're losing purity on a state on average. Uh, we can have imperfectly known Hamiltonians. In fact, we always will have imperfectly known Hamiltonians. We have pulse distortions. Uh, and these three different types of errors lead to things like unitary errors and crosstalk, which I'll come back to later. So with a um, quantum computers, the actual technology is fundamentally analog which anytime you're dealing with an analog technology, you'll always have discretization errors. You'll always have issues of you can only learn things to a finite precision. So there will always be errors. So why do we think quantum computing is viable? Well, because we can use quantum error correction to discretize the errors into nice sets. The way we do this is we encode information in one of a set of orthogonal subspaces, process the information, measure which subspace the system is in, apply a correction, repeat along a lot of many, 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 many times and decode information. And each time we do the measurement, it collapses the system into one of the orthogonal subspaces with one of its discrete class of errors. So it's a lot simpler to analyze and predict. And also we can turn continuous parameter things to a much lower dimensional space. Important points to note here is that the correction operator and um, the measurement, all of these, the, the right things to do to encode the information and process it and apply corrections all depend upon the precise details of the error model you have. If you put in a bad error model uh, and, and come up with an incorrect error model and come up with a procedure, it might not work. So the grand challenge for quantum computing is to take an abstract circuit and a physical system 
and find initialization procedures, pulses, readout procedures, subspaces for encoding, correction operators, and everything else, so that the encoded computation is sufficiently accurate. And the major constraint here, the whole process must be faster than simulating the circuit using digital computers. Otherwise, the quantum computer is useless. You'd basically be building a, a Rube Goldberg machine. While I love these, they're very fascinating to watch. They're not something that we want to invest a lot of money building on an inter-global scale. So what's the conventional approach? The conventional approach is to construct effective operations as preparations, gates, and measurements acting on small subsystems. We then characterize individual operations, stitch the individual characterizations together to predict the performance of the circuit. And this has been the dominant approach in the community. And unfortunately, there's a problem. It does not work for realistic error models. It does not work for a variety of reasons, and I'm going to sort of expand on it more, but this is a very important point. Characterizing individual gates will fail. You need to do more than that. And I'll explain why throughout the talk. So how do people go about characterizing the individual gates? Well, the canonical method is, um, well, the most commonly used method these days is randomized benchmarking. Um, so suppose we have a gate and the implementation of the gate is, followed, is a perfect implementation followed by a static error. Then if I apply a random sequence of gates drawn from a unitary two design and then an in, a correction gate that's just the product of all the inverses, the average over all gates is a nice exponential decay. And you'll see these exponential decays in many, many, many experimental papers. And this is a nice experiment because the decay rate satisfies, um, is directly related to what's called the average gate fidelity of a quantum process uh, or a quantum gate, which enables us to provide a or provides a figure of merit for how well the gate is doing. And this is used routinely, I'm just gratuitously showing something from a paper I'm on, um, to do things like assess in different implementations of gates and say which one is better and whether a particular um, operation you're using is for a particular um, pulse shaping method you're using is working better or not. Now the first problem with this is unitary errors. So there are three dominant types of errors that we talk about. There's stochastic errors, um, there's relaxation errors, and these two are fairly benign, at least in the, um, how they relate to errors in a typical circuit. Even though historically these have been the dominant, had the highest probability, they lead to the least, um, they're the most predictable type of error. And then you have unitary errors. And the problem with unitary errors is that their effect depends very strongly on the context. Uh, so you, what, what that means is it's very difficult to decouple errors at individual times in a circuit because your errors can be focused much more or um, they can accumulate much faster. And randomized benchmarking gives the error rate for a particularly benign input measurement relation, which is actually the, the, um, the most favorable one possible. And it may underestimate the actual error by orders of magnitude. So here's just some quick simulations um, from a while ago. If I take the error rate as estimated from randomized benchmarking and put nice numbers of 10 to the minus four, which is you know, at the edges of what's achievable, and look at the total variation distance for random three qubit circuits. For stochastic noise, the output from randomized benchmarking is completely correlated with the TVD in a random circuit. However, when I look at the TVD, the probability of an error for a random circuit under unitary noise of this, that gives the same randomized benchmarking error rate, I can get orders of magnitude greater probability of error. So the first solution here uh, is to characterize the unitary errors. And this is something you definitely want to do. You, if you have an error and you can characterize and remove it, then you should. Um, so you can quantify the unitary part of the error in it basically by how well the process preserves the purity of a state. 
And that gives a nice experiment for estimating it. You can basically do the same type of randomized benchmarking experiment, except leaving off the recovery date, um, date recovery gate, and you'll get an exponential curve where the fidelity is replaced by this unitarity. And together, you can use the unitarity and the fidelity to accurately characterize the average and worst case errors um, for general noise, how errors accumulate in a circuit, how much control can be improved using things like pulse distortions. And so it's a quite a useful quantity. But it doesn't really hit at the, the bigger problem that arises when you have more qubits. So for one and two qubits, randomized benchmarking and unitarity are, are great, but you could also just use process tomography or something along those lines because the dimension of the space is sufficiently small that you don't really need efficiency. When you get to 5, 10, 15, or 100, or 1,000 qubits, or millions of qubits in the future, you need to start worrying about emergent phenomena and new error mechanisms. And one of the, the big error mechanisms that's emerged as relevant in the last couple of years is crosstalk. And so crosstalk is actually something that's relevant from the, the classical telecommunications world. Um, where trans transmitting a signal on one channel creates an undesired effect on another channel. So here we just think of the, the pulse as seen by the qubit driving one Hamiltonian. You, know, you send a signal to try and drive one Hamiltonian, Hamiltonian and you're unintentionally activating another Hamiltonian. The net effect of this is the gates that you think should commute um, because the abstract op operation does commute, um, the implement, so while the abstract in, uh, operations may commute, the implementations of those operations may not, generally will not, which means you have to worry about things like how do I parallelize gates, are they in series, uh, how am I implementing them. You can have solutions like canceling tones, uh, that's a good thing to do, however I just you have to compute the cancelling tones or the decoupling sequences for each combination unless the, com the corresponding Hamiltonians commute and also if everything in your electronics is linear. So the consequences, the main one is that the actual error model for parallelized, parallelized gates is not well defined mathematically. And the Error model is also dominated by residual unitary errors because these, if these crosstalk um, signals are static, then they will put it more systematic, they will produce a coherent error. And this is a problem that we've known about for a few years now. Um, it's been called addressability in some devices from light, from ions where you're shining lasers on things and you're trying to focus the beam onto a single ion. It's also called crosstalk when you're uh, doing it mainly by control wires. Um, but running gates in parallel, uh, it gives notably worse error rates than running gates in isolation. So here's some data from the 14 qubit um, IBM public device from last year. And the, the parallel numbers are essentially above the parallel numbers for each qubit. Each column is a qubit. The orange is bigger than the blue. Sometimes by an order of magnitude in this case, where I've got two times 10 to the minus two in parallel compared to two times 10 to the minus three in isolation. And the gaps are also not very well correlated. So that means a gate may be really good in, is in isolation and much worse in parallel. What this means is that the notion of a gate is in computer science terms, a leaky abstraction. You talk about a gate and you hope it encapsulates all the relevant details, but it doesn't. Um, it misses too much important information, and that information is crucial to determining how to do things like compile into a minimal depth or a circuit with minimum error, how to do error correction, how to mitigate errors. All of these kinds of things need more information than is encoded in the gate level. So when you have a bad abstraction, you should fix it. The natural way to fix it is to talk about a clock cycle, uh, analogous to a, a cycle in a CPU. So here a, a clock cycle is based on a period of time, delta T, 
And user facing or theorist facing, which is me, it corresponds to a set of gates acting on subsets of systems during the time period. System facing or towards the experimentalist, it really means what are the control signals that will be applied during that time period where that could include all of the fancy decoupling sequences, all of the additional techniques that they uh, spend a lot of time trying to develop and optimize. And that means that if I have a generic circuit, I can divide it up into these time slices and each one is just a clock cycle. And one important point to notice is that everyone actually does this already anyway. So in many ways, this is not a new abstraction. This is just formalizing an old abstraction. Yeah. So that means that cycles are actually extremely practical uh, for stationary noise, where I'm using the technical term to mean uh, that it doesn't have a systematic drift. Um, then we can describe a cycle by a linear map. And if we don't assume anything about the dimension of the linear map, then it can include things like crosstalk or coupling to an environment very easily. And then any well-defined measurable objective function can be used to optimize a cycle, such as the cross entropy or the process fidelity. So this has been done uh, 10 years, uh, sorry, five years ago, um, where the team at Google Quantum AI Lab had a, started with a cycle of operations on nine qubits and they had a 40% error rate. And that was not particularly great, um, but those were the, the initial starting points from the best, post, best local, best independent characterizations. So they then used machine learning to try and optimize it as a parallel cycle and they got a reduction of a, a order of magnitude in the error rate. So that means that you get to, you can optimize the cycle, you can use it very naturally to talk about error correction, but then it still leaves that problem of coherent errors. Thankfully, we can get rid of these using randomized compiling, where we take a circuit that's expressed as a, a list of cycles and make an artificial distinction between cycles that are easy and hard, where easy means I can do it well with very little error and hard means this is going to hurt and this is going to have a very high error rate. And then what we do is around each hard cycle, we put before the hard cycle, we insert virtual twirling cycles from some set. Afterwards, we insert the correction. And then here we have three rounds of hard, easy cycles and we don't want to increase our overhead. So we'll just compile them into one. So an example is if I take the easy set to be arbitrary single qubit gates on all qubits and the hard set to be multi qubit, -qubit Clifford gates. And the twirling set is then just multi qubit Pauli group. Now this idea is used as a variation of this idea is actually used in error correction literature quite extensively, um, particularly in the surface code where random operations are inserted here and then the corrections are propagated to the end. So that works when everything is a Clifford gate that maps Pauli's to Pauli's. But if I'm using uh, near-term quantum computers or if I'm trying to use compilation tools that have uh, non-Clifford elements in them, then as I propagate this through the circuit, it will become eventually an arbitrary and huge bit uh, unitary operation, which then means I may as well have just simulated the computer on the digital, on a digital device. So you really have to do the correction locally or before it's propagate, before it's spread out too much. So randomized compiling works experimentally. It's been shown to reduce coherence and also make a model a better fit to a model of non-Markovian, of Markovian noise. And it reduces errors in typical circuits. So this is data from IBM Q again, uh, the 14 qubit Melbourne device in, taken in January, where running random circuits and looking at the probability of error. So here we have the y-axis is the probability of error, the x-axis is the depth of the circuit, orange are um, circuits without randomized compiling, blue are circuits with randomized compiling, and orange is higher than blue. Um, it's typically sometimes substantially higher, but an important point is that even if it's uh, only just a little bit higher, uh, 
the orange is only a little bit higher and you don't see much reduction. The other thing is that you get a much more predictable behavior from randomized compiling than you do with um, without. So just a very quick proof because I don't like giving talks without proofs. Um, let's take something where uh, just a very quick proof of randomized compiling. So let's we have three gate sets in randomized compiling: easy, hard, and the twirling set. And the criterion we want is that the twirling set, when you conjugate by an arbitrary hard set, hard gate, has to go into an easy gate. And that's so that you can correct the errors locally. If this property is not satisfied, you'll end up propagating to a, to a generic entangling unitary. And then suppose that our noise is sufficiently nice on the easy gates only, so that we can write it as a fixed noise process, followed by a representation, ideally U tensor U bar, followed by another fixed noise map. Under those conditions, randomized compiling maps the circuit with generic looking noise where these theta of H can be very noisy and very generic um, processes into a much simpler one where I've essentially gotten rid of most of the, um, most of the errors are reduced into a single term that commutes with the action of my representation. And particularly with the action of the representation of my easy gate set. Now this is really crucial because that typically means that I have something that is diagonal. And diagonal noise is essentially much easier. They're related, as I'll mention, to parallel channels. So the proof is actually pretty simple, assuming you know group theory. Um, so if I take a term where I have an easy gate, a hard gate, and an easy gate, what I'm doing in a randomized, randomized compiling, I'm putting a twirling gate here, and then the correction gate here. And then I can, essentially use my assumption to rewrite these theta terms for the easy gates and the group homomorphism property to take every, all of the twirling gates and put them in one spot. And then when I average over my twirling gate set, I get the desired result. And I can do that because nothing else in the circuit depends on T, whereas if I was propagating, everything would depend on T and become quite messy. So when my twirling group contains the Pauli group and there is no environment. Scherz Lemery implies that D is a stochastic Pauli channel. That means I can write it as a probability distribution over Pauli operators, which is really where we, the kind of primary motivation for randomized compiling started out. Where I wanted to get rid of coherent errors. And part of the reason for this is that stochastic Pauli channels are well behaved. They minimize the error in a typical circuit in that if I look over the space of all valid quantum maps for a fixed cycle fidelity, the stochastic Pauli channels are the ones that have the smallest diamond norm. And this protocol is robust to arbitrary errors on hard gates, and you can prove perturbative robustness to gate dependent errors on the easy gates, uh, which generally have a much smaller error rate anyway. Now, the reason is sort of the, the next step to go there is we've now kind of gone, come from a gate level abstraction, realize, okay, we have crosstalk, that's a bad abstraction, so gates are not a good abstraction, we can turn into cycles, uh, which are a much better abstraction because they capture more relevant details, and then we can use randomized compiling to turn the errors on those cycles into a much simpler form. Now the question is, can we characterize those errors? So the first step in this direction was cycle benchmarking. Um, so we can use randomized compiling and some additional pre and post processing to estimate the error per cycle acting on the entire quantum computer. And the total experimental cost to, in, to estimate the process fidelity of an n qubit process is completely independent of the number of qubits and practical. So it's, it's not just that the constant is, you know, <laughs> extremely large, but the scaling is good. It's actually both the scaling is good and the constant is good. And the basic experiment is very similar to a randomized benchmarking experiment. I'm going to, or an interleaf randomized benchmarking experiment, where I'm going to do random gates, and then I'm going to put in my cycle of interest, random gate, 
cycle of interest, random gate, cycle of interest, random gate, where these random gates are taken from my easy gate sets. The only difference is that I now need to look at, um, because I'm doing a, a week at 12, I need to probe how my noise is affecting different parts of the Hilbert space. And so I do that by selecting uh, random Pauli operators and preparing eigenstates of those operators. So just to demonstrate it was practical, um, we looked at the, we implemented an experiment uh, with Rainer Blatt's group in Innsbruck on up to 10 qubits. And the only reason it stopped at 10 is just because the numbers are starting to get low and fitting an exponential to a small, to a fast decay is very bad, very hard. Um, so we didn't stop because of the technique, it's just because this is where the hardware is at. So here we were looking at a, uh, uh, looking at characterizing tensor products of single qubit operators. And here we're looking at the process fidelity of a all to all entangling mon Sorensen gate. So this is a global process acting on all n qubits. And the, the experimental runtime for six, eight and 10 qubits was exactly the same up to some you know, tiny fluctuations. Um, just because there's sort of very slight changes in parameters. Um, so how does this work? How does cycle benchmarking work? Well, by Scher's lemma, each irreducible representation will have a distinct, in my representation in, uh, from my noise map, is going to have a distinct decay rate. And in randomized benchmarking, that means I have two different irreducible representations because I've got a global Clifford 12. So that means that nothing is invariant except for the identity operator and the other subspace. And I can learn both of those in one experiment and fit to an exponential decay, but it needs a global entangling gates, which are expensive to produce in general. In cycle benchmarking, I have a, a much weaker 12 using local gates, uh, so, but I have more irreducible representations, four to the n of them. So that's an exponential number of parameters that I would have. I can learn two to the n decay rates from one experiment, although these would not be independent. However, I don't need to. I can sample an average. And because the decay rates end up, because we proved the decay rates are highly concentrated, we only need to sample a constant number of these decay rates to estimate the average to fix multiplicative precision. And the average is directly related to the global process fidelity that captures everything like crosstalk. So that gives us a, a single number, which is good. Uh, that single number will characterize the process fidelity of a, an n qubit process and we can estimate it efficiently. But if we wanna do something like error correction or error mitigation, it's not enough to know the process fidelity. We also need to know what different errors are going on in our cycle of interest, because those are what we need to correct or mitigate. And physically, we expect errors to occur due to couplings and couple combinations of a small number of couplings. And what that means for our, the noise in, in under randomized compiling, which can be written in the Krauss form as a probability distribution of Pauli operators, is that this probability distribution of Pauli operators should be sparse or have a tensor network, or it should be approximately sparse. Uh, we don't expect in general there to be a, a uniform distribution over all Pauli errors as much as some quantum skeptics may use that as an error model. It's, it's not what we see. We see um, different error rates in different, different probabilities of different errors, and they vary quite significantly. And some error rates, some errors don't happen very often at all. Now, the decay rates that we estimate in cycle benchmarking are actually the walsh hadamard transform of, the, of this probability distribution. The nice thing, we can invert the transform and get the decay rates, the probabilities directly. However, that on its own, while powerful, is not very enabling because the transform is ill-conditioned and you would have to learn all of them. However, when you look at the inverse um, transform, you, you can see that it's actually an, a, a direct average. 
And rewriting it as the average allows you to efficiently do the same thing of sample the decay rates and average with appropriate coefficients to learn the probabilities. Using that basic idea, you can efficiently reconstruct marginal distributions. So the probability that um, an error will act on a, as an X on qubit one summed over all the other things it can do on all the other qubits. And you can also look at the probabilities of individual or specific n qubit errors. You can do both of these, these reconstructions or estimations efficiently in the number of qubits. We can also stitch together the marginal distributions into a globally consistent distribution up to a normalization factor. So how does that work in practice? Well, we did some characterization on IBM's public devices. Um, so they launched five devices with five qubits in 2019 on the same basic T architecture. And the C0 error rates as measured by randomized benchmarking are 1%. I just want to emphasize, if you read a paper and someone says, I have a C0 error rate of 1%, they mean that, that they have estimated using randomized benchmarking and it's 1%. This is the standard way people estimate the error rates of a gate. It turns out that it is wrong, that it is the standard way. So if I have four cycles, so then we, we can look at these T shape and we go, okay, what cycles can we produce from that? Um, well, I can do four cycles that have one CNOP gate because there are four couplings, and I can do two C cycles where I can parallelize two couplings, the 0, 1, 3, 4, and 1, 2, 3, 4. And the single qubit error rates are basically negligible compared to the CNOP error rates. Again, as reported by randomized benchmarking. So then in January, um, actually while preparing the, the first version of this talk, um, I ran the data on some, um, well, I and my team um, ran some experiments, some of it while I was actually in the, the talk just before. So kudos to IBM for having extremely reliable service that I could do that. Um, but I we can characterize all marginal distributions on qubits targeted by one or two gates. So for cycles with one C0, that ended up being about 2000 circuits. And this is somewhat comparable to three qubit process tomography and the amount of information you get out. And about 6,000 circuits for cycles with two CNOPs, which is again comparable to four qubit process tomography in the information it provides, but no one has actually done four qubit process tomography fully. Now the number of circuits per cycle actually scales logarithmically with the number of circuits and with the sort of generation up to 30, 40 qubits without too much problems. Um, it's just getting the, the time to on the 30 and 40 qubit devices is somewhat elusive. Now we run this, we get a lot of data, an awful lot of data. And the main thing I'm going to point out from this, so the white, the, the columns are the different cycles, the y-axis are different Pauli probabilities, and I'm not really going to point out to anything except to notice that most errors are correctly reported as negligible. And this is a very good thing because this is exactly what we expect. Uh, we're not overfitting on this. Um, we're not having to do any kind of joint fit truncation, anything along these lines. There's just naturally the method without any kind of um, fancy post-processing will say most errors don't actually occur if most errors don't actually occur. That being said, it's very hard to look at this table and get out very useful information directly. So we're going to remove all rows where all errors are below 30% of the maximum error probability. And you get a lot less popping out, which is really quite nice. Um, so you know, just compare this one, which has several hundred rows to it, to just the 10 or so dominant error, met, error mechanisms, which we can identify basically for free, uh, very, very cheaply. And so what's important to note here is that the single biggest errors on these devices are actually Z errors on idle qubits and ZZ errors 
or Zn, Zz errors on idle qubits. And the probability that these errors occur is actually worse than the error reported by randomized benchmark. So randomized benchmarking was reporting the sum of all errors on the C0 as being around 1%. Whereas here we have roughly a 5% probability of a Z error on qubit three. And incidentally, if we look, uh, I realize the axis is a little tricky to follow, but um, this column, this row here is going, is the errors on the C naught itself on the, on the qubits that it's actually targeting. And the one which is purple basically means there's no real error here. And so the, the cycle that has the worst error, the worst total error rate is actually the one that has one of the best c naughts. if you just look at the qubits that are being affected by the c naught, So just to re-emphasize, if you take the randomized benchmarking numbers and you say, what's my best gate? What has the smallest error um, quantified just on the systems that I'm actually acting on, that I think that I'm acting on? you will get the complete wrong order um, for what operations are best compared to the actual true errors. Um, so Burlington and other five qubit devices more extreme, completely dominated by single qubit Z errors, not even the ZZ here. Um, <coughs> so looking at that, we thought, okay, can we try and fix these Z errors? So randomized benchmarking can be used as a metric to, or a cost function to optimize gates. However, there are some limitations in that approach because it scrambles different error types. However, with noise reconstruction, what we can do is identify the dominant errors using noise reconstruction. Then we can construct a reduced set of experiments to estimate those errors, the, the probabilities of those specific errors. And then we can sweep control parameters that are tied to those errors even virtually through a remote API to someone else's system to minimize those errors. <clears throat> and on IBM Lon IBM's London device, which I picked because it was the big, most dramatic, of course, um, we were able to remotely reduce the, the Z errors from a whopping 40%. So that's 40% of the time you did a, a C naught on a pair of qubits on particularly on qubits three and four, a Z error would occur on another pair, on one of the idle qubits. And we could reduce that down to 10%. Um, <clears throat> there's a reason we couldn't go lower in the amount of time we had, uh, but basically what's happening, just seeing, showing the kind of sweep parameter, we're looking at a, a Z compensation angle that we're artificially compiling in, and the probability of the error and you can see the yellow and the blue are the, um, oh, sorry, the orange and the blue are the probabilities of X and Y errors, and they're not changing too much as we change our Z compensation angle, which is exactly what we would expect because we're not really introducing as an X or a Y error, we're introducing a Z error. But the green changes, so the zero point here on one of the qubits, it was close to the minimum and fairly clean. But if I look at one of the other qubits, everything's a little bit haywire at the default angle that they have, uh, which is the, the kind of the setting that they've calibrated, is something like 80 degrees off the correct value when you're doing a C0. Um, <clears throat> and when you're that far off and you have that high an error probability, a lot of the fitting methods just start to fail, just as a, as a, a minor point. Uh, if you see, um, very pristine error bars on things that have 50% error probability, you should probably be skeptical. So why couldn't we get below? So in this case, we could get to about 10% or 15% um, on qubit one, Z error. Why couldn't we get lower? Well, running noise reconstruction on the optimized version, we find that we have a large, about a 10% probability of a ZZ error. We can't correct that without using some more lower level access, lower level API tools than we had access to. And there's also a stochastic noise floor where if I have a 80 degree mean offset on my Z, I'm probably going to have fluctuations about that. And when I have fluctuations, they end up being something I can't correct systematically. And notice that the error in the C naught itself 
is actually still negligible compared to all of these other errors. So the, the error on the, this, the, the C naught that was being run on qubits three and four was perfectly fine. It was doing an error rate of something like one and a half percent. And the rest of the device on the default setting had a 40% chance of going haywire or even higher. Um, and, and with the optimized one, it was down to 10%, but the C naught itself was fine. <clears throat> So that's to kind of re-emphasize, if you want to use a quantum computer and you want to use it for something, especially where you can't check the answer, you need to accurately and efficiently model quantum computers. And if you want to try and improve the performance, you're going to need to do this extremely well. The standard approach reporting errors in terms of individual gates, it is the standard approach, but it's wrong. It is inaccurate. It does not capture effects like crosstalk and it probably won't capture further imagine effects as we get larger devices. Models based on, on cycles capture more experimental imperfections and are still practical. Um, and randomized compiling engineers are more benign and predictable error source that we can efficiently learn using cycle benchmarking and family noise reconstruction. Just quickly, we want to sort of do further work to adapt error correction and mitigation techniques to cycles with sparse noise and study control theory for cycles more and algorithm compilation in terms of cycles. And the pictures here were produced, well, the pictures that were good were produced by this team, the pictures that were bad were produced by me. Um, and these are great guys to work with who produced the software on a benchmark that I used. And um, the theory behind this was done in collaboration with a lot of people. And there are open positions at University of Waterloo and at the Quantum Benchmark. So please contact me if you're interested. Okay. Thank you very much, Ralph. Thanks. So we can have now some questions. So um, I'm certainly interested in asking a question. I think this is a very interesting study. Um, do you think that if if you got uh, the you know next next level of access and you were uh, had your hands on this machine, I presume that you would know how to um, reduce these error rates uh, significantly. Um, I guess my question is, how far do you think you could really go, and do you think it'd be even sort of another another layer of errors that would remain beyond one's reach, or is there a feeling that one could actually close this whole story and really have genuinely a a quantum processor that has low error rate in all respects? So the single cubic gates that they have are very good. They're on the level of 10 to the minus four. Um, you know, that is starting to become, you know, it's not standard, I would say, but it is the standard goal. Um, and it is beaten in some places and some platforms, okay, very occasionally. With gates that good, we, and knowing exactly what the errors are, we would know how to insert. So if you know you have a ZZ coupling, you know how to decouple, you know how to refocus that, right? You, you add some X pulses on one of the qubits um, while you're doing the cross resonance gate and that will essentially refocus the, the ZZ. I'm not sure exactly how well if that would work, um, but that is what they do in labs anyway, right? The devices that work well have these kinds of refocusing pulses built in. Um, I would say that the, those 10%, 15% could be completely eliminated as dominant errors mechanisms just by those recoupling pulses alone. Um, as to what the residual noise mechanisms are, well, I'd have to run and see. I, you know, I'm, I don't see any fundamental reason why we can't have, and I know the devices exist that have more than 20 qubits and have error rates much smaller. These are also IBM's public devices, so again, they're not the best IBM has to offer either. Um, so yeah, we can definitely get lower error rates. Uh, at the exact amount, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. I can just jump in uh, to say that there are some ideas now for out there for ZZ3. 
uh, to keep it gates. Yeah. So that could um, lower beyond the, the echoing sequences that you just mentioned. I would have a question. So um, I'm very impressed that you can actually improve the experiment. Um, so, you know, we theorists are traditionally very good in predicting the past. Yes. Can you walk me through how long that takes and how much human intervention is involved? Because, you know, we learn from Google from the um, really interesting part of the supremacy paper, which is the technical appendix, the importance of uh, efficient calibration. So um, can you walk me through the resources that that last demonstration needed, human and time? Yeah, sure. Um, so this sweep, uh, wrong button. So this sweep here took somewhat less than 20 minutes remotely. Okay. Um, and it took more data than I needed to take. Okay. So fast. But it was still semi-automatic in the sense that you had to do it. Well, I had to say here are the dominant errors. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, it ended up being about five Yeah, I would say about five lines, the correct five lines okay. in, like, in my company software. So okay. yeah, like the, it's not, it's not, you know, it's actually now a standard example in our stuff. Uh, so if you go to our, I don't want to make a sales pitch, but if you go to our documentation, you'll see it as an example. There. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So it's quick. Um, Got a question to throw in. How well do these methods deal with uh, drift or you know, ch continuous changes of parameterization? Uh, so, short or long time? Uh, sorry, you were cutting in and out yet. Um, but I assume oh, your question sorry. was how well does everything with drift? The question that immediately comes up is what's the time scale? Um, if the time scale is sufficiently long on the drift, then everything is fine. Um, when they, if the time scale is too fast, I mean, you know, I said, so the 2000 circuits used for the five qubits is slightly more than you need um, because I was kind of going sort of beyond what I would tend to recommend, beyond the default options, but you would still, you know, if you're not stable on the order of a thousand circuits, running, being able to run a thousand circuits, then you know, we can't help you. Um, I, I, I don't think anything, you know, you need to make your system more stable. Um, but I mean, uh, and, and what about, I mean, because it's one thing to calibrate the circuit and it's another thing to have, you know, you calibrate the circuit and your parameters drift and then you have to recalibrate. Have you done much work into figuring out some optimal calibration method or like, you know, some optimal calibration repetition rates or anything like that? That's a good question. Um, so I would say that at least part of the problem with calibration drifts is that they introduce coherent errors. Those are all, that is suppressed. So you can actually go longer between calibrations. I would need to actually say, how much are your error rates drifting um, before I can even really say, you know, you can run it. You would need to establish that your error rates are stable within a certain tolerance for a certain length of time or have this much gradient. And you can start doing that with our techniques to get kind of the, the base points, but we haven't had sufficient control over when things are run to be able to timestamp and do that study. I will say Do though, have not just just as a minor point. So these were IBM's public devices, right? They calibrate them once a day. And I actually took the data to do the sweep and then did the reconstruction over 20 minutes. And then a few hours later did the reconstruction with the data point from 
the fitting. So at least the superconducting qubit platforms I know of and are, are capable of doing it and are stable enough. There's also cycle, uh, data in the cycle benchmarking paper with Rainer Blatt's group showing where they looked at the drift and it's stable enough. Okay, so we have a question here from uh, Dennis Wilsch. It says it's about uh, leakage or uh, the question is, have the relation for the fidelity on slide 13 and the bounds on slide 14 been studied for non-trace preserving maps? It says that may be important in the presence of leakage, for instance. Yes, in fact, I've seen that question from that. I could respond to that question. <laughs> so, um, the short answer is non-trace preserving, um, no, you, you need an extra one and it's actually a little bit complicated. Leakage is one of those funny things. It's funny because it's, in my experience, it's an experimentalist go-to explanation for anything that goes wrong. It probably is an explanation for some things that go wrong but no one exposes an API where I can actually study leakage. No one records to outcomes. And so it's very difficult for me to determine what's going on. And I have seen a number of cases where people said it was leakage and it wasn't. And the reason it wasn't was because they could try something else and that, that had nothing to do with leakage and that fixed the problem. So leakage is definitely a problem. Um, I don't know about the exact nature of those bounds in a sense because I'm not as concerned about the exact nature of those bounds. Those bounds I was more concerned with because I realized that there is a problem. Um, the, the gap between them is massive and that gap will obviously be just as big or bigger if I have leakage. And so the question for me was how do I get rid of the gap to make things more predictable? And I do that using randomized compiling, which will work in the presence of leakage. The same, the basic math works. I still get something where I diagonalize it to the channel um, and it doesn't really matter whether it has leakage or not. Um, so the sort of no, and, but at the same time, I don't think it's the most pressing question. Maybe I could intervene and uh, bring us to a halt so that we could have a five minute break, say. Um, but I, I thank you and uh, I think that was a very interesting con uh, contribution. So let's take a five minute break. Uh, some people can have coffee, some people can have lunch. Uh, Frank Wilhelm can take out the trash. <laughs> I will. Thank you.